I would like to call to order the mayor, uh, the meeting of the mayor and board of aldermen for March the second, and we will start by uh, adopting our agenda for the meeting. I do have a few additions for your agenda. At 11A, we will add consider temporary sign provisions. At 12A, we will consider the change of scope of work for our sound engineers. At 16A, we will add presentation of findings from OPD, investigation of the animal shelter. And to the consent agenda, I will ask you to add, and you've got a memo in front of you, rehiring of Chad Carwell at the Oxford Police Department. Any other changes, Ashley? No, ma'am. Any other department head with a change? If not, could I have a motion to accept the agenda? I move we accept the agenda. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Any opposed? All right, we'll start with the mayor's report tonight. Um, we'll talk more about this when we get to number 11 on our agenda, but the vaccination site at the National Guard Armory is providing about 1,000 vaccinations a day, and it is running so well. Huge thank you to the Mississippi Department of Health National Guard and the nurses that are participating there and our own Jimmy Allgood for helping that to run so smoothly. Um, there was a letter to the editor in the Daily Memphian where the writer talked about their experience in coming to Oxford and getting their vaccine, and she ended it by saying, um, Shelby County doesn't need help from the federal government, Chick-fil-A, or FedEx. They just need to ask our neighbors in Mississippi. So I thought that was a pretty good compliment for, um, for our site. Dr. Dobbs told me this morning that we were at about 15% of Mississippians being vaccinated, and I was super encouraged to hear that um, we have about 50% of those 75 and older vaccinated. I think that is a wonderful statistic, and 45% of people 65 and older that have um, a pre-existing condition, so those that could qualify for vaccinations now, 45% of the folks in that category have received at least one dose. So I thought those were pretty encouraging statistics. You know, we're still seeing that our black community is not being vac vaccinated at the same rate that other communities are. And Dr. Dobbs was kind enough to join me and to participate in a virtual vaccine forum that um, was held on Saturday morning with the Tallahatchie Oxford Missionary Baptist Women's Auxiliary. So it gave us an opportunity to, and to talk to other nurse practitioners, to talk to people in our black churches that um, joined us for that forum and they got to ask questions and we talked about what are, what are the things that are holding us back in the black community to get people vaccinated. And we came up with a lot of creative ideas and now Dr. Dobbs is working with some of those nurse practitioners to make some of those things happen. So. Um, that was really a huge plus for us. We still have computers available at OPD and at Fire Station 1 in the lobbies. OPD's office is open 24 hours a day for any resident that needs a computer to access um, the Department of Health website to schedule an appointment. I attended the ribbon cutting of the Oxford High School Fine Arts Center yesterday, and it is amazing. I encourage all of you to go and see this wonderful new facility at Oxford High School. They have a culinary arts facility, a huge theater, a band hall, art classrooms, a recording studio. I was, my mind was blown. It was exciting to see that come to fruition after they've talked about it for so long. Um, and we have a second fabulous school district in our in our midst and we have two successful sports teams from Lafayette High School here tonight and so I am first going to ask the girls soccer team to come up front so that I can recognize them. So Mayor, so you're just going to do this in your report? Oh, no. Well, that no, it's on the agenda after my mayor's report. Yeah, okay, okay. Hey there. How are you? Welcome. Welcome to all of you. These ladies just secured their third, that's three in a row, state championship in soccer. Um, I want to read out to you their names so that you know who to brag on. 
Um, our varsity team roster is Caitlin Ray, Grace Foster, Anna Lafferty, Avery Trelor, Ayanna Jones, Sarah Perkins, Hudson Lindsay, Lily Grace McCutcheon, Maddie Ahmed, Caroline Wilson, Caitlin Johnson, Lucy Wilson, Valerie Smith, Caroline Perkins, and Julia Perkins. And our head coach is Melinda Scruggs, and assistant coaches are Maddie Shearer and Lance McGregor and Katie Shepard, and the manager is Molly Grantham. We are so extremely proud of you, just rock star girls. I love some girl power. I got to recognize them last year, and here they are back again for doing the same thing. We are so proud of you, so proud of how you represent our community, and y'all just keep giving it all you've got every day, knowing that there are a whole lot of people cheering for you. You're welcome, Jake. We are so thankful for your support, this Thanks. community, everybody in town. Um, we just are so thankful for and blessed. And so I just am super proud of everything that these girls have done. Obviously, the hard work has paid off. Go doors. <laughs> Way to go, girls. Thank y'all for joining us tonight. And not to be outdone by the girls, the Lafayette High School boys bowling team is also here tonight. So we'll ask those bowling team members to come up front. Welcome. Hey, y'all come on up here. Come right here and face face that way so they can all see you. Welcome to all of you fine gentlemen who just won their third, yep, three in a row state championship in bowling. We are so proud of you guys. Um, the, the team is coached by Kelly Summerall. And we have Jacob Robertson, Daniel Bumgardner, Nicholas Cohen, Matthew Atkinson, Levi Freeman, and Xavier Wallace here. And we just want to tell you guys how proud we are of the way that you've represented Oxford and Lafayette County as um, you have, you know, just brought home the biggest trophy they've got three years in a row. So we thank y'all for your hard work and the time that you have put into your sport and wish you well. Let's do four in a row. Absolutely. Congratulations. All right. Um, as they exit the room, we will move along and ask you to authorize the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting on February the 16th, 2021. I move we approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I'll ask you to authorize the approval of accounts for all city departments. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ask you to consider the consent agenda with the addition of letter H, rehiring someone in the police department, and you've got that memorandum in front of you. Motion to to approve the consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? I ask to request permission for the Oxford Garden Club to plant a butterfly garden along the sidewalk um, from the Oxford Old Armory Pavilion to the restroom building. So that's at the corner of University and Bramlett Boulevard. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And thank you to the Oxford Garden Club. I think that'll be fun to have a beautiful garden there on the way to the uh, community 
larger garden. Yeah. All right, next we have on our agenda to adopt a retirement resolution for Kenneth James in the Oxford Utilities Water and Sewer Department. I don't believe that Mr. James is here, am I right? Okay, as he is not here, I won't read the resolution, but could I have a motion to adopt it? So Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, next on our agenda, we will discuss COVID-19, current restrictions and guidelines, and the current executive orders. Jimmy, I'll get you to come up and, and give us some details. Um, for those of you who are watching online and for those of you here in the audience, I know that it has not been lost on anyone that today uh, Governor Reeves has issued um, what he hopes to be his last executive order and has really um, opened everything up wide in the state of Mississippi. Municipalities are still granted the opportunity to be more strict, but not more lenient than, than the governor's executive order. We've always based that decision on numbers and data. And so Jimmy will present those numbers to us tonight. Uh, good evening. Uh, for today, the state had 301 new cases with 44 new deaths. Our local numbers, uh, Today, we went up to a total of 5,736 cases. That's three new cases from yesterday uh, th that we went up. Right now, our incident rate is sitting at 13.8 uh, per 100,000, which is 58th in the state. Uh, of, yeah. Over, over state, a seven yeah. day, uh, in the seven day average of cases is 7.4. One thing I want to caution on these numbers is is they were getting better before the ice storm, but there was no testing and no vaccinations for an entire week. So they may be a little bit on the low side right now. We may see a slight rebound, but we can track that the numbers were coming down before the ice and snowstorm. Right. But because of, of the state and the testing facilities, a lot of testing was delayed for an entire week. Um, Let's see, active cases as of yesterday, uh, we had 54 active cases in the community uh, and a total of 113 deaths. Uh, and as you can see that you have a second sheet and uh, that, that tracks the number of cases by day along with our total number of cases. And you can see that break point of from February the 15th until February the 20th how low the numbers are. Like I said, there was no testing. And we've see a, seen a little bit of a rebound this past week uh, with, with the numbers. Uh, um, I always report on what our hospital capacities are, which is, you know, really what our main focus has been um, for the past few months is how do we maintain an appropriate number of hospital beds to, to be open. And, and so as of uh, yesterday, we have 181 staffed beds. There were 17 folks with COVID in the hospital and there were 36 beds available. We have 24 staffed ICU beds. As of yesterday, there were only four people with COVID that were in ICU and there were eight ICU beds available. So our hospital numbers look really, really good. Really, really good. Um, so, so as I stated, and I'm let you, Jimmy stay up here so that y'all can ask him questions. He knows much more than I do, obviously. But well, one other thing I wanted to mention on the vaccination site. Yeah. We have vaccinated 15,644 Lafayette County residents. That's great. They've vaccinated a lot more people than that, but that's how many Lafayette County residents that have been vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are wanting to get vaccinated, um, this morning there were 1,500 appointments available. So um, I hope that anyone that's watching will go to COVID-19. Uh, uh, no, yeah, it's it's Mississippi Department of Health website, COVID vaccine. COVID vaccine. We made that as hard as possible. That'd be covidvaccine.umc.edu and sign up. And um, you can also go to their site and see that there's a 1877 number that you can call if you're having problems um, trying to schedule that online. Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the governor today announced that a year ago today was the first executive order that he issued regarding COVID-19. And um, here, um, exactly a year later, he introduced an executive order. I don't even know the number of this one. 
there have been so many that I can't I can't keep up anymore. But he issued an order today that um, opens everything 100%, removes the mask mandate, and only has requirements for schools grade K through 12 and for indoor sports arenas. Is that correct? Am I saying it right? Uh, indoor arenas. Indoor arenas. Okay, so indoor basketball is at 50%. Correct. Outdoor sports are at 100% per the governor's executive order. So, you know, we have always based things on numbers and looked at data. As Jimmy just shared with us, our numbers look really good. I, I had hoped that this day would come on a day that we also were announcing that their vaccines are open for everyone. That was my hope, and I think that we are right around the corner from seeing that. Um, but uh, this is where we are. So just let the board discuss what um, whatever your takes are and how you want to move forward. I think that the state is ready to open. Mayor, I mean, I'll be for I'll, I'll go first. I think that we have done a great job here, and a lot of that was because we were more strict than the governor's orders early on, but um, I don't see any reason now that we would not follow the governor's guidelines, although I would hope that anybody that still felt like they wanted to wear a mask could wear a mask, and any business owner that wanted to have a sign out in the front requiring a mask should yeah. still be able to do it. Um, but that's my feeling. I, I, I would I would uh, be for following the governor's guidelines. I'll second what John says, that we've done a wonderful job uh, yeah. I agree. With your leadership and Jimmy's help and uh, all the department heads. Uh, but I do think it's time that we kind of get back to some sort of normal. I'll, I'll Personally, I'll continue to wear my mask, but I don't think yeah. it's something that we need to mandate. And uh, but de definitely in K through 12. Um, but I, I'm for going with the, with the, the governor's orders. Mm -hmm. I've um, already gotten a couple of calls from senior citizens. They call me because I guess I'm the oldest one <laughs> on this board. But um, the, their concern is um, essential businesses, like going to the grocery store. They're, they're, even uh, senior citizens who have been vaccinated know that they're not fully immune until two weeks after their second shot. And some of them have only gotten a first shot. And they said, look, you know, we gotta go get food. And um, we would hope that the mask mandate could stay in place for essential businesses like grocery stores or pharmacies. So I don't know, what do y'all think? I'll let the board the board speak to that? Yeah, I'm in favor of, of um, businesses making their own decisions, yeah. but I think we should keep the mask for grocery stores and think places you have to go where you don't make a, I mean, you can go to a restaurant, that's your choice. A ball game is your choice, but I mean, you have to go to get your groceries. So I'm in favor of keeping it for essential businesses, but uh, restaurants, bars, if Yeah, if stores. the board decides to, to go that direction, I think because of enforcement that that becomes difficult. We dealt with this on the, on the front end of what is essential. So if that's the direction the board decides to go, I would want us to have a very descriptive list because we will get the phone calls of am I essential or am I not yeah. and I, you know I think it's difficult at this stage of the game to um, to require masks in some places and not in all indoors but I, that's the board's choice but I will want y'all to give me a specific list of what you consider essential if that's the way you want to move forward well I mean my mother had groceries delivered for a year I mean, you don't have to go in these places if you don't want to. Um, it, it's still, um, you know, you you can still choose to wear a mask when you go in there. Oh yeah, but the but staff the wouldn't be wearing a mask. That's you know, and I don't know. Some of the those essential businesses they may have uh, corporate rules that require them to continue to wear masks, and that hmm. would be great. But we don't know that. Uh, and uh, as an alternative, th they may want to have a longer time period 
set aside for, you know, they have that senior hour. Mm -hmm. And at Walmart, it's like six o'clock in the morning from six to seven. I never made it there at that time. <laughs> Didn't get there once. And I think Kroger is like four days a week from seven to eight. If, if they could just expand that, that would be helpful. I just worry about people not going and get groceries, you know? Yeah. Uh, not everybody yeah. wants them delivered, John. Some fo folks like to pick out their own veggies, you know? So, um, I don't know. Maybe we should contact the, the grocery stores. Sure, we can do would, that. We don't have that many. Contact Jimmy did that them. the first go round just to ask them ask to. Ask them what, if, if they could do something to uh, accommodate the people who want to wear masks. And yeah. just during those hours, their staff wears masks right. and... Maybe it's not senior citizen hours, it's people that want to wear yeah, mask exactly. hours. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you'd like that as a two hour block or a three hour, uh, what time frame? I, I would say a, a two hour block and you know, Walmart six o'clock, that's fairly early. Yeah, it is rather <laughs> early. I didn't even know they were open that early, but I guess they are. What do you think, Keisha? You think that'll get it? Yeah, I was going to say a, a time that we're not just for seniors later in the day, maybe yeah. two hours in the morning, maybe two hours before they close or, or, or in the we, middle I of the day. Later in the day, you're going to run into complete headaches with yeah. people walking in there. Yeah, I think that's why they do them the first two first hours two because yeah. I know the first go round when we were talking about this, they wanted to do it the first two hours. That's when the store was the cleanest. Yeah. They hadn't had people yeah. walking through all day and, and touching things the and weekend. whatever. So maybe over the weekend for the the weekend, yeah, the weekend people or the because right now they don't they don't do it on the weekend, right? And that'll be something that each store will just yeah. we will make the the call and encourage, but yeah. that'll be something each store can determine if they want to offer that or not. And I think that we'll see that with yeah. stores across the community. Some, I believe, mm -hmm. will still say that they want their employees. I've already heard from several that said, whatever y'all decide, I'm still gonna require masks in my business. Can I do that? Absolutely, you can. And so I think, you know, I think that's kind of where we are is that we will have places that still require masks because the owner of that business and the employees want to go that route. And I think there are others that will decide not to. And I think that's okay too. I think everybody, we're to a point now where vaccines are available. Mm -hmm. And we have maintained that we will get to a place where people can make choices about, do I want to get a vaccination? Do I want to wear a mask? Do I want to stay home? Am I comfortable being out yet? And and those become our you know personal freedoms and own decisions. Mm -hmm. And once vaccinations are available, we start looking at these numbers and, um, you know, I, it, it, is, it is certainly evident that our cases have gone down and our hospital's in good shape. I hope that people will continue to wear a mask, but I do believe we're at the point where it's a it is a request, not a requirement. Yeah. So businesses, if they wish to continue with masks, of course, can do so. Sure. And if you'll check with those other businesses, I don't think we need to... I don't think Set we need hours, to put yeah. anything no. into uh, an executive order. But but you know what we but, could offer them, Janice, is that we would advertise it yeah. through our social media. Sure. If they would commit to having shopping mm -hmm. hours for mass required, then we yeah. could advertise that Absolutely. through, you know, just good. promote those businesses that are doing that, I think. And just on a personal note, I really hope that the restaurants will continue to to do curbside for people who don't want to come in. It's been great, really, for... Yeah, and I think we ought to keep the parking meters there for a while yes. like that and everything else. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think for a, a, a little... I mean, we got a meeting or two or three or how many we want to wait. I, this, is, this, is, this is what you're waiting there. I'm not... Yeah. I'm not opposed to it at all. I think it has been wonderful. And I've heard numerous restaurants say that even as they've opened, they have the same customer base that is right. still preferring curbside. But once things are open to 100% capacity, those parking spaces become needed for folks as well. And so that becomes the, the toss up there is if but we're those, opening to 100%, then it's, you know, that's... But those parking meters, we can address that. In it, every two weeks if we wanted to. Sure. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Those are the two things that I wanted to bring up to you um, is curbside, whether or not you wanted to go forward with that. Does anybody have a different opinion? I, I think we need to keep it going. I mean, okay. I, I, it, it just gives that other option if somebody doesn't want to go in the restaurant. Yeah, sure. It just gives them an, another way to generate 
needed income and still serving patrons safely that don't want to go in the restaurant. Okay. So I think it's a good then option. Then we'll leave the curbside spots as they are. The other is outdoor dining. Um, we have already had, I believe it's five, bar, correct me if I'm wrong, we have five businesses that are still doing outdoor dining for the month of March. And here we are at March the 2nd. Um, my request to you all would be that we keep it going until the end of March. We'll look at it again then. We're, we're running into problems, you understand, once we have a crowded square again, when we have these, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a professional word other than Bush League, but these Bush League sidewalks and ramps and putting people through these narrow chutes and whatever all worked when we had a very reduced capacity on the square. It, it starts to present a lot of problems now that now that we're bringing a bunch of people back. So if it's good with y'all, let's let's push that forward through the end of March and kind of reevaluate. Sure. Does that yeah. does that work? Yeah. Do we need a motion to do that to the end of March or? I think your, your licenses are good to end of March. Y'all right. consider it your next meeting just so everybody knows they're gonna get pulled or go forward. Okay. Um, and so we will leave the curbside spaces as they are. We will continue outdoor until um, the end of March for sure and, and look at that again maybe at our second meeting. Once we get a little further down the road of um, what our Jackson Avenue East plans will be and that kind of thing, we'll kind of reevaluate there. So, any, any, I need some input from you all. I, what direction you want to go? I was going to say, I, I'll, if you, if you and Jimmy and Janice and whoever will handle the talking to the the grocery stores, I, I'd like to make a motion that we follow the governor's order. I'll second. All right, any comments or discussion? The, the only thing, it's just to clarify that what that would mean is the violations of the governor's order, because there are still some things in that, would be treated the same way as violations under those resolutions and orders that we previously passed. Sure, yeah, it still has the same enforcement clause his, his uh, does. It only applies to K through 12 now, but yes. Okay, so a motion and a second, no other comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, wonderful. We are getting back to normal walks for Mississippi. We are headed in the right direction, but we do, I wanna reiterate, please still wear your mask. People have gotten used to it. It is, um, it is something that uh, we know protects other people. So when you're in crowded places like the grocery store and things, um, please be considerate of folks and pull it on if you don't mind. Um, next, we will have a third reading public hearing on a proposed ordinance amending Chapter 34, Article 3, Noise of the City of Oxford Code of Ordinances. So I'll get Ben Requette to come up and um, Dave Woolworth is here. I'm sorry. Oh, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. Well, y'all can be coming on up here, Rusty, but um, temporary signs. We um, had allowed temporary signs, banners, all of those kinds of things that did not meet our sign ordinances to be in place due to the fact that people were having to advertise curbside and different kinds of hours and, you know, are you open for indoor dining or are you not? And we wanted people to be able to get those messages out clearly. Now that we are back to 100% capacity and those things are not issues, um, we need to determine, we had said we would consider it again at this meeting, the temporary sign provisions, and I think that we've removed most of the reasons for having them by opening everything. So you all tell me. I think we're ready to go back to enforcing our sign ordinances, don't you all think? Well, I think we should have some type of, okay, we're gonna start letting businesses know and they'll start enforcing in two weeks. Or, right. You know, give them yeah. time to sure. fill this out. Oh, I of don't course. Know, some of them, it might be better for four weeks. I'm not really sure, because I know some of them have substantial money into them, I don't know. But if you want to go to two weeks, that's good. But at least give them, okay. Ben, what do you think? Say ben. Ben. See ben. Uh, you know, early on in the process, we actually developed a letter, uh, an informative letter to, uh, uh, that we can provide to the businesses and we can modify that. And uh, so if you set a date of when this goes into effect, we can uh, absolutely, uh, update that, modify it to reflect whatever language we need to, and uh, and then begin the process of notifying businesses. Email we can we can send it out. We can post it on social media and the website as yeah, well. I think that's great. Good. So All right. Fine. Man, man, I think 
think that's enough time. Okay, can we do that in the form of a motion since we had made a motion to um, set aside those provisions? Make a motion to return to our sign ordinance. For temporary signs. In two weeks. Sounds good. Second. All right, all in favor? Uh -huh. Any opposed? Great. Now, for number 12 on our agenda, the third reading and public hearing regarding the um, ordinance on sound. So, Ben, I'll let you get us started. Uh, thank you. In your uh, in your packet, you should have uh, the most recent version of the uh, the ordinance. With uh, it does have a few modifications based on our conversations at the at the previous meetings. Uh, those are highlighted in yellow. We did define uh, outdoor ambient music. We also defined outdoor entertainment. Outdoor entertainment would be uh, live or pre-recorded music or even a broadcast. Um, uh, that's presented at higher sound levels in an outdoor environment. So we define that, and then under, um, um, and uh, if you recall, it was discussed about, uh, I think, uh, uh, the concern about the enforcement of, uh, of dogs or animal sounds that were made, and so we made the modification to, to uh, be consistent with the other uh, application where uh, if it's heard from property line of the residence, so we incorporated that language in there. In 3466, we did re, uh, include the restrictions on outdoor entertainment, and so uh, still subject to the requirements of this ordinance and also the zoning, uh, the zoning districts, but then outdoor entertainment would be restricted to 10 a.m. Uh, to 11 p.m. We also incorporated, if you recall, uh, the placement of loudspeakers and the, and the regulations associated with that. Uh, based on uh, uh, Dave's uh, input. So those are the, uh, the changes to the ordinance that we made since our last discussion. Um, I do have a packet here of correspondence that, uh, and you know, studies and information and handouts is provided to us by our consultant in addition to other, um, uh, you know, other information, research, and studies that we use to help inform our ordinance and then also correspondence that we have received to date that I would like to include as part of the record. Sure, please do. And Dave's here if you do have any questions or uh, um, you know, otherwise happy to entertain anything you need. Okay, does the board have any question or comment before we allow for public comment? Did we take out the permitting process for anything after 11 o'clock? We did. Okay. Okay. Any other questions by the board? Ben, if, tell, I, for some reason, I'm having a hard time with this. Uh, uh, it, it'll open it. There it is. Give me one more time on the outdoor. Is the time frame still the same as? Will you say it in your mic so people can hear you, please? The time frame of the outdoor? For the outdoor music is 10 a.m. until 11 p.m. Indoor music can continue until, until 1, 1 right. a.m. Got it. Okay, that's what I or, want. Or based on, you know, whatever the zoning requirements would be. Okay. No, I'm ready. Here's, that's helpful. Okay. And, and when you have that outdoor defined as 75 dBA, five feet from the source, is that, that's in section 15, is that, is that five feet from a speaker, or is that five feet from the, yeah, property I think line of the source. To provide a, a, a little better explanation of that five feet, but I think it talks about that there's higher there's higher sound levels outside, and so uh, he can better describe that uh, that situation. I'm good. Uh, just to answer your question, five feet from the source would be the loudspeaker. We can clarify that in the language. That simply is to delineate between what's considered a background or ambient loudspeaker and something that's used for entertainment. Okay, and that's DBA, not DBC? That would be DBA. Okay. So in case it's DBA, I'm sorry. It is, it is listed as DBA, I just. You don't have to spell it. We've heard words like that before. I was just thinking in our other conversations that the DBC was something because of the lower frequencies was easier to measure and control for music, I was just wondering why DBC isn't used in the um, in the outdoor and only DBA. We we can add it. I think it's just for the simplicity. And the other part is uh, at five feet from it, you're going to be picking up the loudspeaker. 
Okay, you're not gonna be picking up the, you the lower frequencies as much. You, you can pick up things from other people, but generally people will not be, um, the two situations are, are, are different enough. And it's clear enough in this case that, that, that this should, the number chosen, it should fall out pretty easily. Okay. Say that's clearly louder than this. And if it's loud enough, if it's used for entertainment, people won't be five feet away from it. Okay. They generally will be further away because it's going to be too loud. It's, it's sort of a fail safe more than okay. anything else. Okay. Thank you. And there's a second, uh, by the way, there's a secondary uh, uh, way to handle this, and that is at the property line. Okay, any other questions from the board before we hear from the public? All right, Kirk, you wanna come, you're, sure. you're leaning up. I'll we'll call on you first. Do you, you don't have to go first, anybody can go first. You just, you look like you were ready. Um, and, and I will say um, this is um, a public hearing. We would ask just for time concerns that you not repeat what other people have said before you and that you keep your comments just as short as, as possible. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. I have one quick question for, for yeah, Ben. Sure. So the outdoor entertainment provision is strictly limited to 11 p.m. outdoor entertainment, but outdoor ambient noise or ambient sound can go till whenever that establishment can be open. Correct. Is that that's correct? It, it's, it's, yes, absolutely. Okay. Say that one more time now. So, I guess I was asking for a clarification that outdoor, my understanding is the ordinance differentiates between outdoor ambient, sound, and that may be the wrong term. But Basically, live music is what we're talking about. Right. Versus piped in music. Versus, versus just speakers. That, or television sets yes. or whatever. That's, yes. yeah. Or just a whole bunch of people yelling at yeah. Right. Right. So, that can go on till. The one o'clock. One o'clock, but the live music must stop at, at eleven o'clock. Okay. Um, yeah, based on uh, these revisions, um, and just I guess for the public's concern, uh, I represent the the owners of High Cotton and One Hundred One Van Buren um, and Harrison Square condominiums, which are one of the few. Uh, residences uh, in the urban historic district and what they would like the board to consider is amending it to prohibit live music outdoor live music 200 feet from a residential building um, as opposed to a residential zone and I, we th think that this makes sense based on the 2030. One more time, Kurt. You're asking that it be amended to not allow live music? Outdoor live music 200 feet from a residential residence or residential building. Uh, and, and considering kind of the goal of the 2037 study to include more mixed use establishments. If you're gonna have commercial on the bottom and residential on the top, the only way I can see you can limit this is if, if by prohibiting the outdoor music within a distance from the residence or residential building. So that's what we would ask um, the board to consider um, based on you know everything that Dave has told us about how hard it is to control um, outdoor music. Um, is this the be, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Would that be the establishment or the actual, I mean, 200 feet from any part of the establishment or 200 feet from maybe the deck on the back side of the uh, bar uh, restaurant? of the bar restaurant. I, 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 I think it's so small a difference that I don't know. It'd have to be measured from the closest edge of the offending building. I don't know how else you'd do it. 
So the closest edge of that. Um, fair enough, but uh, in light of the permitting process being being taken out um, and the 11 p.m. limit, that's that's our request. And I also have I received via email while I was here um, a petition by 53 of the 98 residents of those three units, you know, requesting that. Uh, Okay, let me throw a hard question at you Certainly. that I'm just thinking about sitting here. So if, you know, something is already an established bar that has a balcony or a porch or whatever, has outdoor, you know, I think of outdoor. I mean, some of our restaurants and bars, to me, are really outdoor once all the windows go up and the garage doors go up and whatever all, you know. I mean, it, it's kind of like an outdoor venue. So what if that venue is there and someone comes and builds residential beside it? So I'm saying, I mean, they get a special exception to build that. So what, how do we handle that makeup? You come back into the uh, grandfathered in clause, but that gets sticky really bad. Um, well, because they sell the building to something else, then it's right. a dress shop That's and they sell it back. Yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to figure out it almost has to be based on zoning rather than use, it seems. I don't know, but I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm sorry to be the no, devil's advocate, no, but no, I just, I, fair enough. there are question. a lot of lots that can be developed yeah. that they could get an exception to build residential on that's right next to things that are currently restaurants or bars. I don't know how how we would then, we can say, oh, somebody's building a house over there. Now you've got to, or somebody's building apartments or, you know what I mean. I don't know I mean, how and, the other, and the other thing that we did is we encouraged converting commercial office space to residential during this pandemic and to help property owners. So there's some some things that are currently commercial office space that could be residential, or if you look at where the residential and, and mixed uses around the square now, I mean, you have a lot of residences, you know, scattered around the square so it's not just the people you're representing i mean it's you go down van buren and you go down jackson avenue and there's residents you know sprinkled throughout there up north lamar so uh, you know to me the the change that they've made limiting it to 11 p.m and dropping it down to 75 decibels five feet from the source that's that's fairly stringent. That's a long ways from where we started. You know, I was going to say also, uh, Mayor, we, we just last meeting, we had a third reading of another ordinance that we were amending. I mean, this is one ordinance that I feel 100% sure will be amended again right. one day. I think that's fair. Um, I mean, we've never had a sound ordinance, and I just think, or at least not anything like this, and, you know, I think that we've done a lot of due diligence here, or, or at least a lot of a lot of research and a lot of work from Ben and everybody else. Um, I, I mean, I'm not opposed to looking at changes now. It's just I, I don't know if I know enough about about what I want to change now. I think sooner or later we got to go with something and see what happens. I agree with you, John. I mean, it's you know, and it'll be a work in progress, I guess, as we go along. But um, have you talked to your clients with the new 75? deviate five feet from the source instead of five feet from the line? I mean, have they yes, really? Yes, I, I, I have, and, and my clients have run a decibel meter just this weekend with just ambient noise that, you know, from their balconies that puts it at 65. And, and it's, the one thing that Dave's demonstration showed me you know, out back is when I stood next to the meter and talked, and, and we talked about this, you know, it went up to 75 with, with me just I was standing there talking. response, yeah. you know, versus music. And, you know, I made some notes from the meeting during the ice storm, you know, Dave, you know, saying they've been working in New Orleans for 10 years on the thing, and I think that it's it's a very hard thing. It's very hard to, to draft legislation to control physics. And, and the only way to control it 
that, that I see is putting distance between the sound and, and the resonances. And while there are resonances in, in other parts of the square area, really in the urban historic district, the only residence is the Ritz. And that's more than 200 feet away from the nearest restaurant bar. Um, and so that's why we felt that distance was a reasonable distance to ask for. And as far as the mayor's question, you know, on what if somebody, you know, converts it, quite frankly, that's up to that developer to pay somebody like me to do the due diligence to find out right. if they're going to have any kind of problems with that. Um, I'm trying to solve problems of people that are We're already established. There. And I get it. I'm just, yeah. if this becomes sure. an ordinance, then it affects all of those moving forward. I mean, that's that's my concern. Yes, if, if we could just address it project by project, that'd be great. But once we adopt an ordinance, it's, you know, it's there no matter, no matter what. Um, so you were saying that the residents that you represent are good with this version asking for one amendment to not allow live music outdoor 200 feet from a residential building. That's the yes. one change that yes, you're proposing. Okay, just wanna make sure I yes, got it down. Okay, Thank you. anybody else have a question for Kurt before he sits down? Well, I mean, I'll ask this since, uh, since you're talking about it. What would that do to the one outdoor place we're talking about right now? From, from, its, it, they, from its property line, what you're saying is they wouldn't be able to have it. They could not have live music. They could have ambi the ambient music. Okay. I mean, that that's my my understanding of that. I don't know. the lo We have two other outdoor it, venues that are, that. that are presenting things right now, and I don't know how it would affect them. I don't know the distance. And, and I'm sure that there will be plenty of, you know, people that want to build and develop, you know, those type of establishments is the concern of the people that have to sleep next door to it. That's right. Absolutely. I wish there was the, told Kirk this one day when we were analyzing it, I wish I had a magic wand. This is one of those that you just, you just can't, there's no, you know, exact balance here that um, makes it great for everybody. I wish there were, but we appreciate you, Kirk, and representing folks and, um, who else would like to speak? We welcome anybody else up, and Kurt can come back up and answer a question if somebody has one for him. I'd like to speak for me. You certainly may. Come on up. Good evening. I'm Stuart Paval. I'm an architect here in Oxford, um, developed design studio. I have a, a couple projects going that um, have an interest in this uh, ordinance, and that's why I've been paying attention to it. I've offered some input along the way. Thank you all for humoring my, my input. Um, the, the projects that uh, particularly that we have designed are Lamar Yard, which is down South Boulevard. It's uh, okay. completing construction now. And we're in, um, they've just broken ground on uh, David Blackburn's development out on CISC, which is planning future phases of you know outdoor uh, dining and, and entertainment venues. Um, both of them have asked for me to um, it, some of the input I've offered along the way has been channeling things I've been hearing from them as well as my own uh, per professional and personal opinion on it. Um, and so they've asked me to, to say that th they're very much in support of the ordinance as it currently reads now. They think it's a good balance. You know, David in particular, he's got uh, residents and homes to sell at the same time that he's got, you know, this mixed use development that he's trying to, to uh, work on as well. So he understands you know, that balance in particular. Um, the, I, I, I wanna point out, and y'all have kind of touched on this, that uh, Ben and I have had these discussions numerous times about ordinance. You know, he's, he's reminded me as we've been lightly butting heads that uh, the ordinance is a living document that sometimes um, needs to be interpreted and also needs to be able to evolve over time. Um, I've, I've in turn uh, reminded him that it should also seek to remove arbitrary um, uh, uh, and sub subjective determinations by the city and its agents to sort of set the rules by which we, as an architect or otherwise, are supposed to live by. Um, and it, the, the ordinance, as it 
reads now, I think is set up well uh, to sort of meet those two goals that it, it, it prescribes um, ways by which determinations are to be made by decibel levels and hours. Um, and, and I think those ways that the determinations are to be made are also ways by which this can evolve by tweaking hours, by tweaking decibel levels. Um, so that was sort of touched on before that it, it, it seems, in my opinion and in my client's opinion, it's set up well for y'all to revisit this over time uh, when it needs to be revisited, but that as it reads currently, it, it seems to be set up pretty well to help businesses and strike a balance with residents that um, w would have to live you know, in proximity to this. So uh, just wanted to speak on behalf of, of those two businesses that I think everybody's kind of buzzing about and excited about, we're excited about it, um, and, and in support of uh, my own personal support as well. I think that it's, you know, th this is kind of the, in my five years in Oxford, I've fallen in love with it and it's got, it's got a scene, it's got a vibe. And, and I think that this is, you know, only gonna help, not only help businesses um, that will, will need uh, ordinance like this, but, but also, you know, help, help Oxford uh, grow long-term. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Stuart. Anybody else want to speak? Griffin? Tanner, I represent Harrison's, which is the uh, adjacent property to Harrison Square Condos and the, and the other places that Kirk was representing. Um, we are expanding our outdoor space that y'all have seen, and, and our goal is to become an outdoor event venue. Uh, we've already set up some weddings for 2021, um, a lot of outdoor events that we're excited about, and this will benefit us. And what you're doing is... Um, exciting and I think very fair, um, regulated well. We have had some questions from the people that are talking to us. One of, one of the groups being the Mississippi, which has been at Foxfire Ranch in the past. Um, and it's an it's a all, all weekend long event of different bands and things like that. And, and I think that we can operate within the, the spectrum that you've given us. And that, that brings several thousand people that, that have been going to Foxfire Ranch that can, can now come to the square, enjoy food and beverage, shopping, um, all the things that make Oxford great, and that was our goal with this project. And I think that we can work together. Um, I think the time um, constraints are fair, and we're also open to working with our neighbors. Uh, but we have to keep taking steps in the right direction. I think that you all have it measured out properly and fairly, and um, I think we want to see y'all move forward with this so that we can get open and, and have, you know, movie nights for kids and Thursday night concert series in summer and, and things that will bring tourism back to the square and uh, continue to grow us just like we've seen Double Decker do over the years because it brings so many people from all over the state and regionally. Um, and we're excited about that. So I just wanted to thank you for, for making this a reality. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Griffin? All right, anybody else that wants to speak? We did receive, and I forwarded it to y'all right at the end of the day. This gentleman called me today, Kevin Paprath, who owns um, a unit at High Cotton and said that he couldn't be here tonight but asked that I share this information and I didn't get it till the end of the day and I forwarded it to y'all. I don't know if you saw it, but Mayor Tannehill and others to whom this may concern is an owner of a unit in the High Cotton Building and as I am aware that a meeting on proposed ordinances will occur soon, I would like to take a short opportunity to weigh in with my opinion. I recently purchased a unit in the High Cotton Building. I had the option of choosing a place on a quiet fairway at the Country Club or any number of places that surround the downtown core of Oxford. I chose the location on the square not for the peace and quiet, but for its proximity to the energy, vibrance, and the many cultural entertainment and dining options. I want to be near the students, the visitors, and the revelers. 
These units command a premium for their location, a location that sits within the historic commercial district. The owner, the original developers, as well as the past and current owners of the units at the Ice House, the Van Buren, High Cotton, and Harrison Square were and are aware that this has historically been a commercial district. Long before the residential development of these properties, which, by the way, required a residential exemption to this area on the east side of the square, <laughs> has been home to many historical entertainment venues, such as the Warehouse, the Gym, the Hoka, Ireland's, Murphs, Frank and Marley's, and others. I do not believe it is ethical of residents to purchase property in a commercial and entertainment district and then take a not in my backyard approach in attempting to stifle the cultural and entertainment experience that is an amenity to both students and non-students in a large part of what makes Oxford such a special place. I would not purchase a condo in the French Quarter and then complain about Mardi Gras, nor would I purchase an apartment in Manhattan and complain about the lights and sounds emanating from Times Square. I am aware of a change.org petition and attorneys taking up the case for some area residents. I'd like you to be aware that not all owners in the area support this. We were notified after the hiring of an attorney to represent our HOA. The board members <laughs> took action without consulting broader ownership and do not represent the views of all owners. I've spoken to numerous owners regarding this issue, and I'm not alone in my opposition to these actions. I cannot tell you how many are in favor or how many oppose the adoption of noise ordinances, but neither can the HOA board as there was never a vote taken with a quorum of owners president. It is my desire that Mr. Patel, Harrison's, and the area residents may find common ground and some sort of compromise that will benefit all. I don't know how you can pass the ordinance for the gully area of the Southeast Square without affecting other businesses in East Jackson, Lamar, and throughout the downtown commercial district. I wish you well in settling this issue, but I'm against harming the assets and amenities of the many for the benefit of the few. So I'll put that into the record as he asked. Um, all right, anybody else have questions? Anyone on the board have questions? Things you need to chew on? Where, where are we? I think we're ready to go with this, don't you, Ben? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting to think about um, one of the good side effects of COVID is it is it has made us take advantage of our outdoor spaces, everything, parks, uh, outdoor entertainment. I think we're just going to appreciate more being, being outdoors doing things. So this will help. I'm going to make a motion that we adopt this uh, sound ordinance as it is. I'll second. All right, any comments or questions from anyone? Any statements from anyone? All right, then we have a motion and a second to adopt this ordinance as it is. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Ben and Rusty and Dave for all of your work. At uh, 12A, we have consider a change in scope of work for Dave Woolworth and his his firm, and I didn't write it down right here. I'm gonna let Bart do that real quick. Oh, you're just right. Roland Woolworth and Associates. Just to remind everybody, we started this process of sound ordinance back in October of 2019. That's when I brought you the original contract from Roland Woolworth and Associates. Obviously, the scope and the amount of work they've spent on it, the amount of th things we've asked of them have sure. greatly grown from the three outdoor demonstrations to the walk arounds to that type of stuff. So we're just asking you to amend their contract to a not to exceed amount of $15,000. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, Ashley, sorry. Uh, request permission to apply for the Walmart Community Grant in the amount of $2,500 with no match for the Oxford Fire Department. Uh, yes, uh, Chief, this is the only thing Chief had on the agenda tonight, so I said I'd take care of it for him. This is a grant that he has applied for um, multiple years, and I believe they've gotten it. So we're going to apply yep. for it with no match. Absolutely. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? One, Thank you. One thing I should say while we're still um, live is I'm, my iPad, I can barely look at my meeting agenda for all the things that are popping up on it and people asking, okay, so right now we're wide open. Man, I dropped the ball by not saying that the governor's executive order goes into place tomorrow at 5 p.m. So tomorrow, tomorrow at 5 o'clock p.m. is when the new ordinance goes into place. So I should have announced that. I dropped the ball there. But um, that, is, that is what his executive order reads is that it goes into place at 5 o'clock. So, all righty. Um, Chief, 
Consider a request from Stephen Watkins and event coordinator Ellen Thomas of SEW Land Holdings to have a fireworks show following a wedding ceremony outside the Country Club of Oxford on Saturday, May 6th. I think you covered all of it, Mayor. Uh, this is just a decision um, to allow the fireworks show to take place at this facility on that day. So all right. moved. Second. All in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Any opposed? All right, request approval for Adam Shelton and start to finish event management to host the four mile and 10K run starting and finishing at the Malco on Commonwealth Boulevard on April 24th, 2021 from 5 a.m. to 11 a.m. This is what we heard from Pam Swain about at our last meeting. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Request permission for Visit Oxford to have their tunes around town artists at various city locations on March 19th and 20th, April 9th and 10th, April 23rd and 24th, April 30th and May 1st, and May 7th and 8th, 2021 from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. each day. Kenny. Um, yes, ma'am. Thank you for having me. So we do want to request um, event permits for those dates that the mayor said, and um, mostly we would be having art demos, some art um, vendors in the streets, and I just want to be specific about the location. So um, the first two, March 19th, 20th, and April 9th and 10th, those um, would just be in the various square locations for tunes around town on Saturday evening. So um, we've done the cigar shop, which is personal property. We've done um, the City Hall Plaza. Um, we've done Visit Oxford's Yard. And um, we wanted to add Morgan Park this time. So um, I've talked with Ben a little bit about that to work with the residents around that area. And so far, so good. Um, again, it would just be light music, not a big band or anything. And um, it would just be for two hours on Saturday evenings. And then for April 23rd, 24th, um, May 1st and May 8th, we would want to ask for Bowleswally Alley next to Visit Oxford to be blocked mm -hmm. for some art um, demos and vendors. And then as well on those other two dates that coincide with commencement at the university. And um, for, I'm sorry, I left out. On April 24th, we would like the um, alley of South 11th from Van Buren to Harrison to be blocked, so by um, the side of the Lyric, and then um, behind First National Bank. Again, that's just on Saturday, and that would be on Monroe. So there's three alleys on Saturday, April 24th, and then on May 1st and May 8th, it would just be Bowles Wiley. Clears mud, sorry. Okay. No, that's great. Does anybody have any questions for Kenny? This will all be a lot easier now. Well, I, and I was going to say I would ask some questions about this, but I know they're going to do such a good job. But I'm not worried about it. Well, we'll we'll keep everybody informed. We'll work with um, OPD, and um, we won't have to work with Jimmy as much now. So, yeah. Any more questions? Make a motion to approve. Thank you. Second. All right. All in favor? Uh -huh. uh, any opposed? <clears throat> all right. Next on our agenda is presentation of findings from OPD on the investigation of the animal shelter. Um, I'll get us started. You know, believing that animal shelter services are a benefit to our community, the city of Oxford has for many years provided a building and we've funded expenses for animal control and the expenses for animals dropped off at the shelter by citizens of Oxford. The city does have a current contract with Mississippi Critters to provide those services. The city of Oxford does not manage the shelter, does not oversee daily operations, and does not manage their employees. Mississippi Critters has their own governing board. The city of Oxford has a contract with Mississippi Critters, and it's very similar to the contract that we have with the Yacht and Patalfa Arts Council. Um, they manage the powerhouse and pavilion and serve as the arts agency for our community. We own the buildings, we contract for the service of management. We understand that there were complaints filed against Mississippi Critters last week. It's my understanding that the Oxford Police Department and Lafayette County Sheriff's Department have completed an investigation into those claims. We have refrained until tonight from making public statements regarding the charges and complaints, believing it's critically important to allow that investigation to be completed. Chief McCutcheon, though, is here tonight to give us a report on his findings. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> As you all know, the Oxford Police Department and the Lafayette County Sheriff's Department conducted a joint investigation into the Mississippi Critters based on a complaint filed February the 17th of this year. 
During this investigation, 17 former and current employees and volunteers were interviewed or submitted written statements. We also interviewed the president of the Board of Mississippi Critters and the director. Two unannounced visits were conducted along with both agencies involved. All written statements, pictures, and videos were reviewed by our investigators. We consulted with four different veterinarians who worked with the facility or had visited the facility, uh, were interviewed and consulted. An investigator with the American Society for the Preservation of Cruelty, uh, for the Prevention of Cruelty of Animals, the ASPCA, who was aware of the case, was also interviewed and consulted on the investigation. At this time, no information discovered in the investigation meets the elements of criminal charges. However, we will be presenting all of our findings to the district attorney's office for criminal review. All right. I've got a couple of questions for you, and then I'll open it up to the board. But, you know, I know that your investigation by OPD was based on different claims of criminal behavior, and I know that that is what, in fact, OPD was investigating, not to determine if the shelter was well run, but as you have been the one that has seen um, and has interviewed all of their folks making accusations as well as their board and their employees, can you give us just your personal opinion as department head on what our greatest challenges are at the shelter? We did uh, find several issues that gave us a lot of concern and those included overall cleanliness, the lack of detailed records to include any medical care provided, overcrowded conditions, staffing concerns, lack of written policies or protocols, lack of formalized training of employees and volunteers, a lack of oversight from the facility supervisor. There was also concern with the fact that the Board of Mississippi Critters was notified of issues in November of 2020. They completed an internal investigation and led the governing city and county boards to believe that the issues would be rectified. As of the date of the complaint of law enforcement, these issues were not, uh, have not been corrected in their entirety. Also, the lack of transparency to the city and county boards and the public is very concerning. So did you feel like any information was kept from you that hindered your investigation or were you able to fully investigate all the different complaints that had been brought to your office? I don't feel like anything was held from us. However, I don't think that they had the records in place to provide what we needed uh, from time to time. Okay. So for the most part, were the issues that, that were brought to you that you investigated, were those things that had just happened, were they a few months old or both? Uh, it was a series of months uh, dating back to 2020 was, was typically what we were looking at. Okay. All right. Are there questions from board members or any comments that anybody? <clears throat> I mean, I was going to say, but when you read over all those things, it sounds like maybe one of the one of the reasons that we had a lot of those issues was if you went, you had it about fifth or sixth on that list, but was the inadequate staffing. I think we could have not had a lot of those issues had had it been staffed well exactly. enough. Exactly. Yeah, they have had difficulty hiring people during the pandemic, like everybody else. You know, it's just no, sure difficult. We're not going to have any comments. This is not a public hearing, so I'm going to ask you. I'm sorry, ma'am. This is not a public hearing. We did not advertise it as such. We will move forward and address issues. I'm going to ask, because we advertise that as a public hearing, I'm going to ask you not to say anything else or you're going to be removed from the courtroom. Thank you. We were out of last You've got one more chance or you'll be removed from the courtroom. If you want to arrest me, do it. I don't want to arrest you. I don't want to hear from you again when it's not a public hearing. All right. So the, you know, I want to address for a moment since we have talked through what the um, criminal investigation was. I want to talk for just a minute about the city's position on questions and on demands and you know, all the things that were made as this investigation was going on. There have been demand letters and there have been threatening messages left by those who are claiming to report animal mistreatment, some of which believe it's ongoing, some of which, as the chief just said, have been, you know, complaints that have been surfacing for several months. 
you know, demands that something occur immediately or that you do something within 24 hours when there's already an ongoing investigation is simply not how we address city issues. It's not how we run city government. How do you we address. It's not done. You have Ma'am, she asked you to, to be quiet or you're going to be removed. I've been quiet a long time. Well, you're going to be quiet a little bit longer. You're going to need to be going. You want to arrest me? Arrest me. Do it. I've not even had a single traffic ticket. Nobody wants to arrest you, ma'am. We are asking you. Demands are not something that we're going to respond to. We're not going to respond to you. We're not going to respond to 24 hours, you will do this or that. That's not how government works. We address things through conversations and through research. We hold professional meetings. We don't have loud outbursts. We don't do things that way, and we don't seek to influence ongoing criminal investigations. We have now received the information from Chief McCutcheon regarding the criminal accusations against Mississippi critters. And this board will follow up on the non-criminal aspects of the claims of deficient operation of the facility now that we've heard this report. So the City of Oxford contract with Mississippi Critters states that they are, and I quote, responsible for the daily operations of the animal shelter, for hiring and managing employees at the shelter, for care and feeding of the animals at the shelter, for ensuring that the interior of the shelter is sanitary, and for ensuring that the shelter complies with the applicable guidelines for the operations of an animal shelter and with any other applicable guidelines promulgated by the Humane Society of the United States and or the American Humane Association. In addition to, but in no way limited to, the responsibilities enumerated herein, and any additional standards or requirements which may be promulgated by resolution of the Board of Aldermen. Some of the demands that were made upon the city in the past couple of weeks have been to impose different or new standards on the shelter without consideration for the contract standards that are in place. The contract goes on to read, and I quote, Mississippi Critters shall conduct its business on the city's animal shelter facilities in a manner that is transparent and consistent with other municipal businesses and its conduct by sub-agencies, committees, or commissions of the city. You know, it's generally my belief that the shelter has tried to comply with this provision, though it was very hesitant in releasing the results of the prior investigation at the time that the current police investigation was underway. I understand the confusion and uncertainty that the shelter's facing, but it's this Board of Aldermen's general practice to err on the side of openness and transparency. And we believe any prior investigative report should be released by the shelter's board or its director. If there's a reason to believe that releasing that information, if there's not a reason to believe that releasing that information would hinder any ongoing investigation, would releasing that report at this point, Chief, affect any part of the investigation or anything moving forward? No, ma'am. All right. Then I would like to see us move forward with a plan for evaluating the contract for the Mississippi Critters to determine if the obligations are being met or if this board would like to see any changes to the contract in place, particularly in light of what the chief has just told us. I think that we need to see if the contract's being met and you know, determine if there are things that I believe that we can improve on. I'd like to propose that a committee be formed to do this. So I would recommend to this board that this committee be chaired by Dr. Antonow and consist of two members from the Mississippi Critters Board, Chad McClarty, if he's willing, as he's the county appointee, a local vet, and a member from the Concerned Citizens Group that will be selected by this Board of Aldermen. We will also ask this committee to recommend the best course moving forward. So I need to know from this board if there is a motion to establish this commission. Um, Mayor, could you repeat the, I didn't, didn't hear the uh, composition of the Yes, committee. I would recommend that this committee be chaired by Dr. Antonow with two members from the Mississippi Critters Board, Chad McClarty, if he is willing to serve as the county's appointee a local vet, and a member from the Concerned Citizens Group that will be selected by this board. Okay. And we'll also ask this committee to recommend the best course moving forward. But I would need a motion from this board to establish that commission. I'll make that motion. All right, thank you. 
Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any comments or anything from anyone on the board? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I hope to have this commission in place in the next two weeks, and I hope that the people who profess to love animals and are passionate about having a first-class animal shelter will try to work together to find some ways to solve problems and not just point them out. All right, so for the next, we will move to request permission to approve a list of budget reallocations and amendments. Ashley? Yes, thank you. Um, this is just kind of a housekeeping list of budget amendments and reallocations. Um, we are in an election year, so we have to be, um, we are limited to the number of amendments we can do in right. y'all's last year in office. So I will be keeping a closer look at our budget and making a few more amendments than you've probably seen in the past just to keep up and to not make, to make sure we don't hit that, uh, that mark and don't mess up. So yep. that's All right. We I move we approve the list. Second. All right. Is there a second? Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Any Thank opposed? You. All right. Request permission to apply for a grant through Three Rivers Planning and Development for Woodlawn Davis Park. Bailey? All right. This was the grant that we applied for last year. Uh, we felt like we were in a good position to get it. Uh, we pulled it because of COVID and our funds. Uh, what this would do, uh, and we actually backed back the amount. Uh, from last year, and it would be is uh, $120,000 uh, for the grant and then $30,000 from the city's portion of the funds. Uh, it would uh, finish the walking track at Woodlawn Davis Park. I uh, feel like this is a good opportunity for us to get some funds and help us fund this thing without the city doing it 100%. So I'd yep. ask that y'all uh, allow us to apply for the grant. So We'd have to award it and then come back to you. So. Okay. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. I will ask the board now to consider an executive session. So moved. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The board will now consider an executive session.